If right now you were to write the story of your life, what would the first sentence be? Irish poet theologian Padraig Otuma puts that question to groups that he leads. If right now you were to write the story of your life, what would the first sentence be? A participant once responded, once upon a time, in the beginning, I heard a story. Another who'd recently lost a child said, in the beginning we were four. Just after the beginning, we were three. How do you think Mary would have responded that morning while it was still dark, when she sits in that garden alone to prepare the body of Jesus for its final rest? I come to the garden Perhaps Mary's first line would echo Elizabeth Bowen, who said that to have turned away from everything to one face is to find oneself face to face with everything. Why are you weeping, Mary? The angels ask. They have taken away my rabbi, and I do not know where they have put his body. No sooner had Mary said this than she turned around and caught sight of Jesus standing there, but she didn't know it was Jesus. Just then he echoes the angels, why are you weeping? For whom are you looking? Mary supposed it was the gardener and said, please, if you are the one who carried Jesus away, please tell me where you have laid the body and I will take it away. theologian whose name is now unknown to me, once said that resurrection is not something to be grasped, but rather is a mystery that grasps us. Have we opened our eyes one morning after a tremendous loss, followed by months or even years of grief, and somehow life feels possible again? We begin writing a new chapter we weren't sure would ever be written. Or after years of searching for answers or for our true calling or purpose or identity in this life, a path reveals itself. We may look back and see a thread, barely discernible, sometimes invisible, had indeed brought us to a place called here, the place we'd always longed to be. Or have we felt alone in our pain and our suffering but then suddenly feel an opening like Mary did, an opening to express the fullness of our truth and to know that it is heard and honored. Why are you weeping? And our answers become as prayer. Or after years of shame, not believing the belovedness with which the divine sees each of us, we hear our name spoken. 
a voice from above, sugar-coated with love, as Paul Simon sang, that says, ah, there you are. Now let us begin. Easter grasps us in so many ways. do you think Jesus spoke her name over those three years? Why was this time so different? When Mary and Pippin get lost in the forest in the second book of the Lord of the Rings, they find themselves in the company of a talking tree. They quickly share their names and their kind. Who calls you hobbits? The Ent, for that is what he was, asks. call ourselves hobbits, they reply, with an ease interpreted by the talking tree as hastiness. The Ent is both alarmed and amused at how quickly they tell him their names. However, he will not share his own. For one thing, it would take a very long time. So my name is like a story. Real names tell you the story of the things they belong to, in my language, in the old Entish, as you might say. It is a lovely language, but it takes a very long time to say anything in it because we do not say anything in it unless it is worth taking a long time to say and to listen to. Our names are like stories and worthy of being shared and heard. Ianthes Yaya, her grandmother, would open the paper each morning and immediately read the obituaries. And when asked about this ritual, she responded, these were people and they were loved. And sometimes they weren't. I want to be sure each person has at least one person to read about them. Welcome to how God sees you and me. What is apparent about Jesus that first Easter morning is not that he has simply come back to life, resuming a life that had ended three days prior but rather represents a new way, a new mode even, of being altogether. Almost as if to say God's name is a story too. In tale after tale, people encountering this risen one will note the scars of crucifixion still on his body. Perhaps as if to say, while everything we've experienced in this life has indeed formed and informed who we are, Not everything will define us for all time. Wounds become scars. We heal and we open up again and say hello to the new.
Hymns like that one and others you heard earlier are part of me. I first heard them crouched under the organ bench as a child, mesmerized by my mother's small feet on those gigantic organ pedals and the amazing sound that they produced. Whenever I play this marimba, in fact, I still see a keyboard of organ pedals before me. I thought that by this point in my life, I'd be playing this thing professionally, technique far more advanced than what I'm working with today. The reason I'm not is obvious, of course. But that night, during my musical studies, there came a call of no words. Just the overwhelming sense of knowing knowing where life was leading next and what I needed to do. When five years later I was ordained into ministry in the congregational tradition, I posted on Facebook, Reverend Michael. That one's going to take a while to sink in. And I'll never forget my friend Lindsay's response. That's always been your name. You just have a title now. Things rise to the surface in their times and seasons. And if I had to tell of that new beginning today, the first sentence might be, I heard my name spoken in a new way. Or, percussionist puts away mallets to follow in the footsteps of the first Christian preacher, Mary of Magdala, but still picks up mallets from time to time. <laughs> Some pieces of our stories are still fundamentally who we are. honest, it's always bothered me that Jesus tells Mary not to hold on to him. Who among us wouldn't cling if a loved one unexpectedly returned? But perhaps his rebuke is not of her love, but rather of her fear around letting things change, or her insecurity in turning toward an uncertain future. It's as if Jesus says, Mary, you are more than a disciple now. You are a witness that love overcomes death, a teller of the good news that new life comes, a preacher whose pedal note is this, that the worst thing may not be the last thing. God is doing a new thing in the world, in you, in us, and we cannot always cling to the way things used to be. Indeed, this is the paradox at the heart of Jesus, dying to self to find and live our true selves, letting go so that we are open-handed to take hold of life abundant. In other words, we let ourselves grow, allow new life, risky and uncertain though it is, to spring forth. Tis a gift to be simple, tis a gift to be free, tis a gift to come down where we ought to be. And when we find ourselves in the place just right, t'will be the valley of love and delight. I wonder if this Easter tide holds an unwritten chapter in our stories. I imagine some of us could already name its title. If, that we've left buried for so long. What if the resurrection didn't just happen to Jesus, but is something that began in Jesus? Something Jesus reveals as the pattern for all life. How might it story us? And how might our lives bear witness to love's power to overcome and to heal? and make of our world a place where new life breaks forth in every heart and home, like the blades of grass and flowers who in numbers untold have burst forth from seemingly every square inch of every hill and field, valley and mountain in Los Angeles. In the bar, there is a Thank you. 
blessing from Anamkara I read this week. You hardly imagine standing here. Everything you ever loved suddenly returned to you, looking you in the eye and calling your name. And now you do not know how to abide this hole in the center of your chest, where a door slams shut and swings open at the same time turning on the hinge of your aching and hopeful heart. I tell you, this is not a banishment from the garden. This is an invitation, a choice, a threshold, a gate. This is your life calling to you from a place you could never have dreamed. But now that you have glimpsed its edge, you cannot imagine choosing any other way. So let the tears come as anointing, as consecration, and then let them go. Let this blessing gather itself around you. Let it give you what you will need for this journey. You will not remember the words. They do not matter. All you need to remember is how it sounded when you stood in the place of death and heard the living call your name. Thank you.